So years ago, uh, I was in college uh, when I watched a movie that upon my initial watch of the movie, I, I had a very strong visceral reaction to, uh, which was that I, I thought that I had just flushed 90 minutes of my life down the toilet, never to see it again. And, uh, but a couple of weeks later, I, I kind of kept replaying scenes in my, in my head, and uh, I decided to give it another go. Never in my life have I had a, a movie that, that did a 180 harder than, than the great cinematic classic Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I, I legitimately initially thought that I, I, it was the dumbest movie that I had ever watched. And, um, and, and as, I, as I began to, as I watched it again, uh, I, I started to realize that at the time, I wasn't real familiar with Monty Python movies. And if you are, you know that Monty Python movies are ridiculous. They're absurd. Uh, but there, there is also always underlying that ridiculousness and absurdity. There's, there's actual substance. <laughs> And, uh, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail is no different. Now, uh, to get you caught up, if you're not familiar with the movie, you need to, first of all, just pause your life and get familiar with the movie. It is, it is great. It is, it is hilarious. Um, now, to be fair, some people think it's very, very dumb. You are wrong. And that is it's acceptable, but you're wrong. So uh, it's a great movie. Um, but but it, it follows King Arthur in pursuit of, as you might expect from the name of the movie, the Holy Grail. And so he's going through the movie. He's trying to find the Holy Grail. And in the third scene of the movie, uh, it's one of those scenes where there's like a, a, a deep undertone that is, that is meaningful and that is important. And uh, what happens in this scene is King Arthur's kind of going through this meadow, and uh, he runs across a peasant named Dennis. Now, Dennis, uh, as King Arthur sort of expects, Dennis is, is a peasant, and, and King Arthur expects him to just kind of do whatever he says. So King Arthur wants to know about, like, the person who lives in this castle that he can see over here, and he's trying to find the Holy Grail, and, and, and he asks Dennis about it. And, and instead of getting a straight answer, Dennis begins to give King Arthur a pretty hard time, it eventually uh, culminating in some pretty funny lines where, where Dennis goes into a, a big, long monologue about uh, the, the, uh, the imbalances in the system and how monarchies are inherently rigged against the peasants. And King Arthur's like, but I'm the king. Tell me what I want to know. And Dennis, is, Dennis just won't do it. And, and as the scene ends and King Arthur kind of realizes, I'm not going to get what I want out of this guy, he, he leaves and Dennis goes on his merry way. Now, you might wonder why on earth I'm talking about Monty Python and the Holy Grail to start an Easter message, which would be a fair question. Although it's not the weirdest way I've started an Easter message. I started an Easter message a couple years ago talking about Dennis Rodman. So this is less weird than that. Um, <laughs> it actually has a lot to do with Easter. As, as Karina mentioned in the video, we're finishing up a series today called The Goat. And we've been in this series for nine weeks. It's, it's I think, the longest series we've ever done here. And through the series, what we did was we took a look at the story of the most important and powerful king in the history of the nation of Israel, a man named David. And if you grew up in church, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, you've probably heard of David and Goliath. It's the same guy. But David ended up, after, uh, after his battle with Goliath, years down the road, he became the king of the nation of Israel. And he was the most successful, powerful, well-respected, well-known king in the, in the history of the nation of Israel. So we looked at his story from beginning to end to try to figure out what was different about this guy, what was special about him. And he was a great king. But there's, there's some really important things to understand uh, as we talk about Easter Sunday. Because here's the challenge for a pastor on an Easter Sunday. You all know why you're here, right? Like, Jesus rose from the dead. Spoiler alert, that's, that's what today's about. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to make light of that at all. That, that's not, but what I, what I want to do is just simply point out the fact that, like, when things are routine, we, we, don't, we don't feel the weight of them sometimes. So David arose on the scene in the nation of Israel, coming out of a request by the people of Israel. They, the people of Israel went to God and they said, we want a king. And they said specifically, we want a king who will lead us into battle and help us win great victories over our enemies. And God said, no, you don't. He said, yes, we do. God said, no, if I give you a king, here's what's going to happen. The king is eventually going to begin oppressing you because that's what kings do. You think you want a king, but it is not going to go how you expect. And they say, we want a king anyway. And God says, okay. And so he gives him a king. And the first king in Israel was not a great king. He started out good, didn't end so well. David was the second king. And David, for most of his life, was an incredible, incredible king. In fact, when you read the first, like, 
30 chapters of David's story, it almost reads like propaganda. It's like you read it and, and, and you're like, there's no way I could ever live up to this guy. He's perfect. And then everything falls apart hard in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Within that context, if you understand that the Bible is one big story, it's not just individual stories, it's one big story. David is set up as almost this like pre-Messiah, this pre-Savior. What the nation of Israel wanted, if you think about their request, they said, we want a king who will lead us into battle, who will, who will, who will win great victories over our enemies. They wanted safety, and they wanted security, and they wanted peace. So 3,000 years ago, this, this nomadic people group in the ancient Near East wanted safety, they wanted security, and they wanted peace. That's why they wanted a king. We want a king who will lead us into battle. Great victories. Defeat our enemies. Why? So we're safe. So we're secure. And so we have peace. Now, the interesting thing, if you think about it, the Bible as this one big story is a story that, in a lot of ways, it reveals us to ourselves. And so when you read a story like that, a lot of the goal should be to look at the story and go, how am I like those people? Well, I don't know about you, but I've not spent a lot of time praying lately asking God for a king. So it would be easy to look at it and go, well, I'm not like that. But I think if you look a little bit below the surface, you'll start to see something important, which is that for the people in the nation of Israel, they realized, you know, your, your, your average guy, your Dennis walking down the street is like, I can't bring us peace. I can't bring us safety. I can't bring us security. We need someone with power who can do that, right? So we need a king. And if you look down through all of human history, that's just what we do, isn't it? Like, as people, we're in a constant pursuit of safety, security, and peace. That's why kings have existed for as long as they have. That's why, for some of us, we place so much trust and faith and hope in the government. I'm not trying to make a political statement, but we just think that if, like, our particular candidate who happens to believe our particular thing gets into power, then they can give us safety, security, and peace. And we might not be asking God for an actual king. But for most of us in our lives, we are orienting our lives in such a way that we are, we're, we're trying to gain safety, security, and peace. Now, we do it differently, right? For a lot of us, maybe, maybe our safety and security and peace, maybe we're looking for that in, in our job, in, in promotions and in success, climbing the corporate ladder, gaining power, gaining influence. Maybe for some of us, we look at it even in our families and our kids, like, you know, have you met those parents who, like, live vicariously through their kids and think their kids are the greatest kids that are ever born? They're not. <laughs> they're just kids. I have three. They're awesome. They are they're kids. <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe it's in money and wealth. That's a really common one. We have this stuff in our lives that we pursue because we think, if I get these things then I will be able to make all the decisions for myself. I'll, I'll be able to do whatever I want. And when I can do whatever I want, then I will have safety and I will have security and I will have peace. What we don't realize is that what we're trying to do is be a king. Aren't we? I mean, that's ultimately why people wanted to be a king in the past. So they could do whatever they wanted. <laughs> I have nobody to answer to. I have nobody that can tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want. I'm a king. That's, that's what people, that's what humanity has always pursued. And so if you think about it, although initially you might not see yourself in the story of the nation of Israel asking for a king, that's what we all do every day of our lives. We try to figure out how we can gain the necessary tools to not answer to anybody so that we can do our thing and have safety, security, and peace. Now, in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Dennis recognizes that there's a fundamental problem with this. Kings are bad. No matter how good the king is, the, the king always ends up subjugating people, enslaving people, making people do what they want, because that's the point, right? If you're the king, you can make people do whatever you want to do. There's no accountability. It doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want. And Dennis recognizes this. And, and, and again, it's a ridiculous scene. But the truth in that scene 
is that there aren't good kings. And even in the nation of Israel, even as we look at David and we look at the first, again, the first like 50 years of David's life, he was an incredible person. Like the kind, of, the kind of person that I read about and go, I could never have faith like that guy did. And yet in the end, it all falls apart because he was just a man. But what we see in the pursuit of a king in Israel and what we see in the pursuit of a king for ourselves is a desperate desire for peace and for safety and for security. And we'll stop at virtually nothing in our lives to get that. But there's a problem. There's a, there's a fundamental problem with it. And that is that the way we think we gain safety, security, and peace isn't the way we gain it at all. So 2,000 years ago, there was a, a woman who was about to give birth to a king, and she didn't know it yet. And again, if you've been in church ever in your life, you've, you've heard about Mary. And right before Mary, was about to, right before Mary was about to become pregnant with Jesus, an angel came to her, and this is what we see in uh, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth was her cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Now that's the same David. And what you'll notice in a moment is that the angel uh, gives a prophecy about what's to come, speaks about what is to come, and, and reuses this David thing. See, for, for, for Mary, this would have been significant because David was like the penultimate person that you were supposed to be. Being a part of the family line of David was important. It was significant. It doesn't, I mean, we don't, it doesn't mean anything to us, but this matters. And it continues. It says, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And Mary was troubled because, I mean, how often do you have angels talking to you? So Mary's troubles, troubled at his words, and, like, and I read this, and I think like she thought she was going to the principal's office, you know? Like you get, Andrew Schultz, please report to the principal's office, and immediately you know I'm dead. The principal's going to kill me, and then my, my mom and dad are going to kill me. It's just this the way this is going to go. I'm going to be double dead. I don't even know what I've done, but dead. So this is how I read this. Like Mary's like, why, why is the angel talking to me? She's troubled. What, what, what's this about? But the angel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You have found favor with God. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. To be clear, there were 14 generations between David and Jesus. A thousand years. That's, that's a lot of years. I don't know who my descendants were. I don't know who my forefathers were in 1,000. We'll give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This is the birth of Jesus, right? But it's so significant what the angel says to Mary that day. I will, the baby is going to have the throne of David. There was no greater, there was no greater hope that a person could have than to have the throne of David. Now, it's also important to understand that when, when the angel comes to Mary, the nation of Israel was under Roman occupation. They were a Roman uh, province. They'd been conquered by the Romans many, many years before. And so when the angel comes to Mary and says this, the nation of Israel was living in captivity under a foreign nation. If you remember back a few moments ago when I talked about what Israel initially said, we want a king who will lead us into battle, who will defeat our enemies. The angel now says to Mary, we're going to reestablish David's throne. The, 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 the ultimate power of the kingdom was when David had it. We're going to reestablish David's throne, and the kingdom will never end. This would have absolutely been seen as a prophecy that was, that was political in nature. But what they would find out over the ensuing 30 years is that that wasn't actually Jesus' mission at all. The nation of Israel was waiting for a warrior king. See, they believed for, for at this point, a thousand plus years, that there would one day be a Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, who would set them free from all of their, uh, their, all of their enemies, everyone who had ever enslaved them, and they would never have to be under occupation again. 
And they saw this as a political, like a geopolitical promise. And then Jesus is born. Going to reestablish the throne of David. And people are waiting like, when's he going to like get an army? When's he going to, when's he going to rise against Rome? And instead, Jesus did something completely different. Jesus didn't lead through military might, through the strength of armies. Jesus did not pursue the safety, the security, and the peace of the nation of Israel in the way they expected. In fact, if you understand what was happening at the time geopolitically, people, a lot of people were very disappointed in Jesus. It's hard to think about now, but like people were like, that guy? He's not doing anything. But Jesus understood something significant. Jesus understood that actual safety, actual security, actual peace don't look like what we think they look like. Jesus understood that safety, security, and peace in the material realm, in the world as we see it, do not bring any sort of internal safety, security, or peace that we so desperately long for. And so rather than leading a military war, Jesus led a spiritual war. Instead of leading an army in the physical realm against Rome, Jesus led an army of angels against the gates of hell. Because he knew we couldn't have what we wanted the way we think we want it. And so Jesus looked very different. Jesus looked not like a conquering warrior king, but he looked like a humble servant. And it's completely backward from the way we think about it normally. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes writes about Jesus' mindset, his attitude, the way he approached all of this beautifully in a letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi. Where he says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Like, what do kings do? They use their advantages against others. What did Jesus do? Jesus, who was literally sitting on the throne of heaven, did not use that to his advantage, but rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He gave up his rights. The Son of God, the King of heaven, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And then Paul flips the script on its head. He says, so because he made himself nothing, God exalted him. God lifted him up to the highest place and gave him a name above every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says, Jesus understood there was a different reality that is what we needed. And Jesus took that reality on himself. He he became nothing. He took the opposite approach of what any halfway rationally thinking king would have done. A king would have raised an army. A a king would would have tried to conquer enemies, and instead Jesus made himself nothing. And he didn't raise an army of men. Instead, he called an army of angels. And he did what we could not do. And because he did it, God elevated him. The name that is above every name. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus understood that what we want is safety and security and peace. But just like any good parent looks at their child when their child says, can I have all the Easter candy right now? And the parent says, no. Is that because we're trying to ruin our children's life? They believe it is. Is that reality? Well, no. We're trying to like, keep their teeth in their mouth. Right? We think we want a conquering king. We think we want control. We think we want to have the authority to do and say what we want. Because if we can do that, we're good people, right? It's going to work out. We're gonna, it's going to be good. But Jesus understood that's not reality at all. Just as our kids think that eating 
35 peeps in a day is going to be good for them. I don't understand how they're my children. They like peeps. It's not. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are peeps people and not peeps people. Um, who are my not peeps people? You are the right ones. These things are nasty, man. I don't understand. That's like, that's like the one, let them get stale? In what reality do you say that about anything? Hey, those pretzels, those look delicious. Let's let them get stale. If it isn't good fresh, don't make it. That's, sorry. I did not come to say that. <clears throat> anyway. Jesus understood that we think we, we think we know what will bring on what we want, but we don't actually know what will bring it on at all. And so Jesus, rather than acting as the conquering warrior king, acts as the conquering servant king. He does battle not against the enemies of the nation of Israel in the physical world, not against the Philistines and the Amalekites and the Romans, but he does battle against Satan and against the demons and against the gates of hell itself. And Paul, in another letter that he writes to the church in Rome, makes this very, very clear. And I'm going to warn you in advance. I try to be very encouraging. Paul did not. These are Paul's words, not mine. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous. Like, no one is good before God. Not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. Thanks, Paul. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Got it, buddy. Can we, can we tone it back? No. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. So Paul wasn't known for having good bedside manner. He was known for being direct. That's pretty direct. Like, as people, we're not great. I, I, I grew up um, in the Church of the Nazarene, which is a Wesleyan denomination. If you're a, a theology person, you might know what Wesleyanism is. But uh, John Wesley had a very optimistic view of people. People are inherently good. Um, I am still Wesleyan in basically everything I believe except for that. <laughs> I have run full on John Calvin on people are terrible. Here's why. Like, literally look at all of human history. It always cracks me up when people want to talk about how, like, you know, we can have world peace. What in literally the history of the world makes you think we can have world peace? Because all there's ever been is war and division and, like, people just, people don't get along. Because at our root, we want what we want. Now, for most of us in this room, I'm going to assume, I don't know a lot of you. I'm going to make assumptions about you. I think you're a good person inside. I do. I think you mean well. I think you're doing your best to, to live life and to be a good human. I do. I'm doing that. But I'm still kind of terrible compared to God. That's not encouraging, except... That Paul continues and he says, obviously, he begins to talk about the law, which Paul's referencing the Old Testament, specifically the first five books of the Bible, where there's lots and lots and lots of rules. He says, obviously, the law applies to those whom it was given, meaning the Jews, for its purpose, for its purpose. What's the purpose of all the rules? Is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty. Nobody can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law just shows us how full of sin we are. Did you, did you know that that was the purpose of the laws? I found that a few years ago. It was like, oh, that's, that's useful. The, the, the point is not the laws don't matter. It's the opposite. The point is the laws matter significantly so that we can see that we can't measure up. Well, why does that matter? Ah, Paul answers. He says, we can't do a good enough job. We can't get there. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping all those requirements. And this is something that was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Paul says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, the king. 
And it is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. I want to pause very briefly there. I don't know, for many of you, I don't know your background. I don't know your life. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've done. But I know that no matter who you are, Jesus came for you. It doesn't matter where you've been, and it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've run from God. It doesn't matter what evil you've done. It doesn't matter. The grace of God doesn't pick and choose who's good and who's not. It simply loves unconditionally. And Paul makes that clear next when he says, for everyone has sinned. Everyone. I like that word. Everybody. Everyone has sinned and falls short, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. So people are made right with God when they believe that, Je that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and didn't punish those who sinned in the past. Because he was looking ahead, and he was including them in what he would do at this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Paul says, can we boast then? Like, can we brag? Can we make a big deal about what we've done? Can we, can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No. Nope. Because it isn't based on us. It's not based on obeying the law. It's not based on following the rules. It's not being good enough. It's based on faith. So we're made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. How are you made right with a king? By obeying the king's laws. By doing everything the king said. If you didn't, you ran the risk of dying. That was just reality. You, you do what the king says. If the king tells you to leave your family and to come serve him in the palace, and you do it. The king had ultimate power. The king had ultimate authority. The king could do whatever he wanted, no matter how it impacted you. Jesus, rather than wielding his authority and power over us, sacrificed himself to pay a price we couldn't pay. For a debt that we owed, we couldn't pay. So Paul continues just a little bit later in Romans chapter 5. Because if all that's true, if, if, if we can't be made right with God, if, we, if we're just terrible people, Paul says, therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have, and there's that word, peace with God. Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us, we have peace. We can have peace. We pursue what? Safety, security, and peace. But it doesn't come through gaining power, through gaining influence, through gaining wealth. If so, celebrities would be the happiest people in the world, wouldn't they? Most of them are miserable. Why? Because those things fail. Those things cannot possibly meet the need in the depth of our soul that we were created for. Says we've been made, we, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's an interesting word. It's a word we don't use a lot outside of Jesus. But if you think about what did people call kings in the past? Lord. Yes, my Lord. Of course, my Lord. Anything you say, my Lord. Anyone in authority over you would have been referred to as Lord. Why? Because they had authority over you. That's what the word means. To, to, to confess someone as Lord means to speak that they have control. Jesus Christ, our Lord. A, another way to translate that would be to say Jesus Christ, our King. I'm not King. Thank God I'm not King because if left to my own devices, I'm not that great. We've been made right with God and we have peace with him because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King, has done for us. It says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. 
and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. He says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials because we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confidence, hope of salvation. And this hope, unlike all the other hopes, will not lead to disappointment. In other words, it won't let us down. For we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. In other words, we have peace now. We have peace through what Jesus did. We have peace when Jesus is king, not me. We have peace when Jesus is in charge, not me. We don't just have peace when we like believe he's real. We have peace when he's our Lord, when he is our king, when he calls the shots because he knows the way things work best. And that hope, that peace, it won't lead to disappointment. And then Paul writes what I think is one of the most powerful sections of all of his letters. He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time. When we were stuck in a pit, when we had no way out, when we were afraid we were going to die, when, when, when we knew that there was nothing we could do to fix our life because all we'd ever done was make a mess of it, when we knew there was nothing else that could save us because we tried everything, Jesus came and died for us. And then Paul says, now most people, they wouldn't even die for an upright person, although some people might be willing to die for somebody who's, a, who's like really good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, not while we were upright, not while we were good, but while we were nothing while we were sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, think about that. We, we, have, we have friendship with God. That's a, that's a powerful picture. We have friendship with God. And we were given a path to that friendship not when we were doing things best, but when we were at our very, very worst. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord, our King, Jesus Christ, has made us friends of God. Again, I don't, I don't know where you are. I don't know what your life has looked like to this point. Maybe you've been, you know, my life's been, for the most part, relatively easy. Um, I, I have had uh, amazing Christian parents. My mom, who is still living, my dad passed in November. Um, amazing Christian parents who taught me what it is to, to serve and love the Lord. Um, my sister uh, is an amazing Christian woman. Amazing, like, I, I was fortunate. I grew up in a, in a good church family that taught me to love the Lord and taught me to love the church. Um, I've spent my life trying to serve God the best I know. Like, if you've been around, you've heard this before, but like my great rebellion was in college when I was studying to be a youth pastor. I didn't go to church services for like two years. It's like, stick it to you, God. I'm going to be in services the rest of my life. That was my rebellion. Hi, I'm really boring. It's fine. <clears throat> I've never really walked away from my faith. But what I know is that I... Still, I'm not good enough. And I know that because my life fell apart about eight years ago, and it was all me. And what I know more than anything else is that that happened because I wanted to be the king of my own life, as we all do. I wanted to call the shots. I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to be in control. I'm smart. I'm good at this. I'm, like, relatively intelligent, especially compared to everybody else. Then a funny thing happens. You have kids, and... right? We're arrogant about ourselves. We're prideful. And we think, if I just had the position, if I just had the power, if I just had the authority, if I just had the money, if I just had the influence, everything would be smooth sailing. But we're not a very good king because there aren't good kings. And so Jesus came to be the king so that I didn't have to be because I'm not very good at it. Jesus came to be the king so that I could be saved 
Not from the evil king down the road that's trying to kill me. But from me. Here in a couple of minutes, we're going we're gonna to finish up the service today with uh, a song. We don't do that all the time, but, but today it just seemed fitting. And um, it's a song that uh, when I heard it for the first time um, uh, several months ago now, it was a song that just grabbed my soul in a way that not a lot of songs do. Uh, the chorus of the song says, All hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus, the Savior of the world. And then there's this big crescendo and build, and it's awesome musically. It says, So let every, let every knee bow before the King of kings. Let every tongue confess that he is Lord. Lift up your shout, and with all of heaven, we're going to sing holy. We're going to sing holy. Because I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. And spoiler alert, you aren't either. And that can either be something that's like, oh, you can dig your heels in and I'm pretty good. Or you can accept the fact that you aren't and that you need a king who is. And so what we're going to do as we sing, I'm going to have the band go ahead and come back up. And what we're going to do as we sing is, is um, we're, we're just going to worship the king. For me, this song is very much a confession. And when I say that, like, I've used a lot of churchy words. I actually try really hard to not use a lot of, like, church slang. Because, like, for some of you, you have church PTSD and you don't know what all the words mean, and that's fine. I've used a lot of churchy words today. Um, when I say it's a song of confession for me, what I mean is it's, it, it's an opportunity for me to speak what is true. And what is true is that Jesus is my king. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my Lord. And if that's the reality you find yourself in today, I want you to sing it along with us as we sing it in a moment. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and I want to pray. I want to pray for all of us. I want to pray that, that I'm going to pray very specifically that God will, in whatever situation and season you find yourself in in your life right now, I, I'm, I'm going to pray very specifically that God would, um, that he would make it obvious to you what it is that he wants you to be doing. What it is that, that as king he wants you to be doing. But I also want to take a moment and pray for those of us in this room, and on Easter Sunday especially, I know there's going to be some of us here who are in this boat. For those of us who have not yet been willing to give God control, who have not yet been willing to say, I know I'm not a very good king, and so I need a better king than me. And I want to give you a chance today, if you're in that boat, if, if you're here and you're recognizing like, I've done everything that I know to do and my life still is a mess. And I don't have peace inside. I don't, have, I don't feel like I have safety inside. I don't feel like I have security. And I've pursued money and I've pursued influence and I've pursued success and it's done nothing. It's because you're looking in the wrong places. And it's because all those things might make you a king in your little circle. But you're not a very good king. And so I want to give you the opportunity if you're here today to make a choice to surrender your rights as a king and to take on the attitude of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to used, be used to his own advantage, but instead became nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, humbled himself in obedience to death, even death on a cross. Let me pray for you today. Father, thank you that you are good and that you are kind. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you never fail when all the things of this world, when all the people, when all the status, when all the money, when all the fame, when all the wealth, when it fails, thank you that you never, ever fail. And so, Father, today in this moment, I, I pray for every person in this room. On this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the resurrection, as we, as we celebrate Jesus, we recognize that um, it's only because of him that we have life. It's only because of him that we have peace, that we have joy. And so, Father, I pray for all of us that, that, that you would make it very clear and very obvious to us if there are any areas in our life where we are still choosing to be king. God, would you reveal those to us? As David wrote in the Psalms, would you search our hearts? Would you test us and see if there's any, anything inside us that isn't what you want? God, for those of us that, that, that love you, that serve you, that are doing our best to surrender uh, the kingship of our own lives over to you, God, would you show us what is inside us where we are still playing king? Would you give us what we need 
to surrender that to you. And Father, more than that, for anyone that's in this room right now that has just been playing king for their whole life, for anyone who is sitting here thinking, that's all I've ever done. All I know is control. Uh, I, I, but I've, I've tried everything. I've, I've tried money. I've tried success. I've tried, I've tried everything I know. And I still don't have peace. Father, would you help us in this moment to break away from the lie that we can find peace through those things? And Father, would you help us to see the simple reality that we aren't very good kings at all? Would you help us to surrender to your kingship in our life? So as we get ready to finish up with, uh, with everybody's head bowed and eyes still closed, every week we do this. I want to give an opportunity if you're here today and you, there's just something inside you that recognizes that you've been playing king for too long and you need to quit. You've been trying to play king and it's not working. If there's a if there's something stirring in your soul saying, I want safety and I want security and I want peace, but I just don't know how to find it anymore. I thought I did, and it doesn't work. I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision to make Jesus your king right now. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, and if you speak with your mouth that he is Lord, that he is king, that he is in control, he will save you. That's all it takes. Not church attendance, not all the religious stuff that we attach to it sometimes. Belief that Jesus was raised from the dead, and speaking with your mouth that he's the king of your life. And so if you're here today and that's you, I simply want to invite you to pray a, a prayer along with us. Uh, everybody that, that's a normal part of City North, you guys know the drill. What, what I'm going to do is lead out a simple prayer of faith and confession. And uh, we're going to say it together as a church family. We're going to say it loud. We're going to say it strong. And if you're here today and you want to make that choice for yourself, we're not going to call you out, draw attention to it, make a big deal. I just want to give you the chance to say these words alongside of us. And if you say this prayer from your heart to your Savior, he will hear from heaven and he will save you. So if that's you today, simply pray with us. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you were raised from the dead. I believe you're the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And so today I surrender to you. I'm not a very good king, but you are. So I give you control of my life. Show me, where to, show me where to go, show me what to do, and help me to follow you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ today we pray, amen.